when Master Evil comes to play. And Mama says that it's okay. Alex and Josh are stolen. Good evening, Slashaholics, and welcome to episode number five of Getting Sidetracked with Josh and Alex. I have the esteemed pleasure to be joined tonight by the 80 Slasher Librarian, uh, my friend and yours, but the special star, the guest of honor this evening, is the star of the hit comedy drama coming of age movie 1995 classic Angus, but you also might know him from the teen NBC one episode stint he did on City Guys. He was <laughs> he was all. <laughs> he was also in Van Wilder. If you blinked, you missed him, but that's one of my favorite movies ever, so I noticed him immediately. And he's currently being featured on and co-starring on HBO Max's hit show, Love and Death. Mr. Charlie Talbert, welcome to the show, buddy. I just missed him with you. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I blinked and I missed me. But that's, that's the beauty of working on great projects for a little bit of time. <laughs> sure. You were on Watchmen too. You've been in a yeah, lot of really good stuff, man. Yeah, I've been really fortunate. I I, I actually kind of uh, I relocated um, back in 2014 to the southeast, and uh, I traded larger parts and smaller movies or odd movies for smaller roles in larger films and projects that I really wanted to be attached to. Okay. So it was probably one of the best moves I ever made in my life. And I blind moved to New Orleans. I had never been there before. And I was just like, I'm going to do it. I'm coming. Got sold everything off in my apartment. Two weeks later, I was here. Three week, three days later, I was working on uh, this is the big short. And then uh, I saw the light with Lizzie Olsen and Tom yeah. Edston. Um, I, I love the Hank Williams uh, story, you know, and the, so that, that I really enjoyed that movie. That was great. That was a really good project, man. I really I really was very excited to, to work on that one. Specifically, actually, when I went to set, my my grandmother knew uh, Cliff Rogers, and that was the character I was playing who announces, you know, uh, Hank Williams' death to the to the world because he was on the way to do my show. And uh, my I, I guess my grandma was supposed to go to that show. She never went to that show, but uh, it was kind of neat having that history. And then when I got set, the director Mark Abraham brought me in. He he directed the new uh, RoboCop, the newer RoboCop. And uh, when he brought me in, he brought me in a day early to watch the footage before that scene, just to make sure I was happy with my performance for the feel of that film. And that's when he introduced me to Lizzie Olsen. And funny enough, what is it, seven, eight years? No, seven years to the day, I'm on set again with Lizzie, and she remembered me. And I was just like, you're kidding me. This is awesome. So, that's great. You're, wherever Charlie goes, Academy Award uh, honorees and winners are all over him. Uh, Kathy uh, Bates, George C. Patton, freaking uh, he, Urban George Kirchner. C. Patton. Yeah, Dude, I love George C. George C. George C. Scott. I like George, George C. Patton, C. Scott. Though. He played Patton. <laughs> no, I'm in. Uh, I'm in. No, it's just crazy though, man. Like uh, Urban Kirshner was on set of Angus. He was. How did? He, how did he even become attached to the project in a non-speaking role? He, you know, it's it's kind of funny. Most people know him as a director. In fact, uh, I, I just got done working with uh, for, for Francis Ford Coppola on his latest film. And uh, when I had mentioned Irving Kirshner, the first thing he said was, you know, he directed the second Star Wars. I was like, yeah, absolutely. He goes, he goes did, you, did you know he's the reason that I wrote and directed the conversation with Gene Hackman? I was like, no, that is amazing. But when I learned who he was on set, uh, it was that in itself, that story was amazing because Patrick Reed Johnson, who is the director of Angus, he was the first person ever to see Star Wars that didn't work on the project. So he's fan number one. He's known as fan one. So uh, he called in the favor to Irvin Kirshner and Irvin Kirshner came out and played my grandfather's uh, my grandfather's friend. And I didn't realize the heaviness of all that until I was like done shooting. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My um uh, my girlfriend Nicole, when we whenever we watch Angus, she always says, "If Angus's grandpa was so close with Irvin Kirshner, how come he wasn't at the wedding? How come Angus had to go tell 
uh, you know, Irvin, that grandpa passed away. Uh, do you have any insight on that? No, you know, you know what it is. There's certain people. I did understand it at that age in the fact that there's certain people and certain things you just keep to yourself because when you're married to someone, it's not, um, it's not living the same life. It's mm -hmm. sharing your life. So, you know, you got to have those personal things that make you an individual. And I think that's what that chess game was for him. Okay. I, I, that scene, I, you know, I was literally just watching it before we filmed and I, I got a little bit, you know, kind of like teary eyed a little bit. Um, there was a couple things. I was when I talked to you initially and asked you to to maybe possibly do an interview. I was raised by my mother, uh, and I was also raised in my grandfather's house. So my dad was very much out of the picture. So I probably related to this movie more than almost anybody. Uh, at one point, I weighed three hundred and sixty pounds, Charlie, uh, really really big. Uh, played football. I was JV up until my senior year when they're like, okay, we he can't be on JV his senior year anymore. Uh, we're gonna give him. <laughs> he's going to play uh, or he's just not going to be on the team anymore. Uh, just yeah, a lot of parallels between me and that character. And I probably rented that movie. I bet you I kept blockbuster uh, open for a few years there by renting Angus uh, at least 300 times, <laughs> man. I couldn't, I couldn't you. find it Charlie on VHS anywhere in, in Oregon, man. Right. Right. Uh, there was a, for a while, what had happened was the music was owned by uh, a different company. And when they sold the rights to the film to WB Warner Brothers, they, Warner Brothers didn't pay the extra money to buy the music. So that's, yeah. it went into like obscurity and it was like this cult following for Angus fans. And I would get these random letters and pictures and notes. And I was like, this is crazy. And then all yeah. of a sudden there was a position, uh, there was a petition and, and then they're like, yeah, we got like three or 4,000 signatures. And I was like, wow, I hope it, I hope it all happens for you. And then they, they, they did like a um, kind of like a, a criterion or a special uh, collection where if you ordered it, they would make the DVD and send really? it out to you. Yeah. And that had a picture of myself. I think it was a publicity still of me, Don Steele, who was producer of Cool Runnings, also ran uh, Paramount for five years and uh, ariana and chris owen yeah and perhaps kathy bates i think yeah you're still are you're still good friends with chris is that what i'm yeah you spent like did he uh did you guys spend time together or what i mean you guys <laughs> i love myspace with, top eight what's going on there that, no man i lived with chris for probably 14 years after i i man. mean yeah i i left uh I left high school, told my grandma I'd be back in a couple of weeks, went to go see about a girl, went out to Chris's, and then me and his dad went up and met this girl, and I hung out with her for a couple of years, and then I came back down, and Chris was like, yeah, man, just stay here with us, and, and I did that, and him and his pop took care of me, and that, that's, uh, I stayed in the business for quite some time, and then I quit for a while. Yeah, I saw that you stopped in like 2009, and you did some uh, groundling stuff and some stand-up. Yeah, I, I had done that. I had did that before. I did the uh, Groundlings prior to drop dropping out of acting. I think it was uh, yeah, two thousand nine, right after I did Art School Confidential. Okay. Um, I with Terry Swigoff and John Malkovich and Ethan Suplee. I I uh, dropped out of, of doing acting. I was like, you know what? I'm tired of living like a twenty year old and paycheck to paycheck. You know, blowing it on God knows what. You know, I need to get. A family i need to do that whole thing yeah. so i i stopped doing that and i um i i i got into haberdashery a little bit before i moved back from san jose to los angeles to live with chris so then i became a haberdasher and by the time i long long way down the line by the time i left for louisiana i had already been in charge of like 26 clothing stores for loss prevention clothing dressing hiring firing yeah. so i really got into that and then uh my buddy Chris Berry from Django Unchained. Um, he's actually we did our second film together, which was called Hollywood Horror, and I think that was uh, more of a tax write-off. And he was in uh, Django Unchained, Twelve Years a Slave. Uh, you would have seen him on Salem, The Purge. And he's like, dude, you got to come down to New Orleans. There's plenty of work. My agent wants to rep you. And that was uh, Fiona and Lawrence Turner uh, from LTA. And I was like, all right, cool. Sold everything off. Two weeks later, 
I'm in the car, August 29th, 2014, 10 p.m. I got out of the car and got hit in the face with a cicada, and I said, yep, this was the right move. You're <laughs> like this. <laughs> Alex, yeah. uh, tell me there's an interesting story uh, to how you landed Angus. Uh, I don't know it myself. Uh, how was that? Uh, it was good, man. I, I, I uh, what were you going to say, Alex? I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say Wendy's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I was... Uh, just like the gift of gab that I was just telling you that story with, I was at a Wendy's coming home from uh, the velodrome, the cycling velodrome in Northbrook, Illinois. And I was with a friend of the family and his girlfriend, and it was uh, Tony Ruffalo. And I had kind of worked at his car shop. And in fact, a lot of my family members, cousins and stuff to make some side money, would go work at the car shop doing odd jobs. And, but I really got interested in going to cycling with him and, we were coming back from uh, Northbrook. We stopped in a Wendy's that hung over the freeway. I saw someone behind the counter. It's like midnight. And it was, and I started telling her a joke. And everybody at the Wendy's line and everybody at the 31 Flavors, they're all laughing their asses off. It's like midnight. And this guy's, you know, a few people back going, why can't I get my damn burger? And that was, that was uh, Patrick Reed Johnson. And he had directed... Uh, Baby's Day Out, or not Baby's Day Out, uh, he helped write Baby's Day Out, and he also directed Space Invaders with Ariana Richard, who eventually played my love interest in Angus. And he comes up to me and said, hey, man, you're pretty funny. I'm pretty hungry, but you want to be in a movie? <laughs> and I go, wow. wow. i like, are you hitting on me? And he's like, wait, what do you mean? I said, well, dude, it's, it's uh, 12 o'clock at night. You know, I got boobs wearing this tight shirt. You want me to be in a movie? And he's like, no, 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 <laughs> He's like, we've been looking for this kid for three years, and I, I think you're him. And I said, okay. And then uh, he told me to come back uh, the following Wednesday to to Jane Alderman's casting office, and she cast Rudy. And he told me that, and I loved Rudy. And he's like, this is very much a rudy S story. I said, okay. And uh, – he said, come in and we'll talk. So I came, I told my mom, I got home at like 1.40 in the morning and I was like, mom, mom, I'm going to be in a movie. And she said, shut up and go to bed. I was like, okay. So I shut up, I go to bed. Next morning I, I had to get Tony over and tell her what happened and went down there. And then, uh, you know, I, I, he goes, all right, uh, go ahead and read your sides. And I was like, I don't know what the sides is. And he's like, oh, oh my God, you're that kid I found in Wendy's. He's like, uh, Tell me about yourself. I said, well, I'm a fat kid. Been in love with the same girl from kindergarten to 12th grade. Uh, I like to do impressions. You've got a goofy that way. He goes, you do impressions? I was like, yeah. He's like, do uh, do one of your impressions. What do you do? I said, I do goofy. I do Jim Morrison. I do Elvis. He goes, do Jim Morrison. And I turned around into the corner, and I just started singing into the wall because, you know, Jim Morrison was so yeah. shy. Oh, and yeah. he goes, that's pretty clever. He starts laughing, and I did my other impersonation before. He was like, hey, man, I'm going to give you these sides, these little pages, and I want you to read them, learn them, come back a couple days, read for Jane. I did. And, and then they flew me out to California to read. And then the rest is history. I can't believe, Charlie, that you were focused enough to like capture the moment when you were in the presence of yellow Wendy's. They, that was yellow label Wendy's, buddy. They had the solarium out back. Like you were basically in a fat kid's heaven, dude. I would have blacked out. If I, if that director came up and wanted to talk to me about something, I'd be like, listen, I'm busy, dude. I'm trying to figure out what yes. It's like midnight and I'm already making people laugh and somebody, I, you know, I, I wasn't a stranger to doing stage stuff. So if an audience comes up, I mean, I use humor a lot as a fat kid, you know, to, to, oh, yeah. you know, and, and that's the beauty of like projects that I'm doing now too. It, it's, I've kind of veered away from that, but at that point in time, I knew to feed into that and go with it. And, uh, and then now being in the Southeast or working in, I go to LA for six months. I go to New York for six months. I am treated as a guy, not just a fat guy. So it's, it's really was just a progression of time. That's fun. Um, that is phenomenal. And I, I think, so are you in, so like when you see that like Brendan Fraser won the Academy Award and uh, K. Hugh Kwan won the, like the best supporting actor. I mean, seriously, man, Yeah. that is mm -hmm. like, they're going to make a movie. They are going to make a movie about that moment. And for guys that had success as a child or maybe in their mid-teens like you, it just shows that as long as you don't quit, you always have a chance to do something great. I mean, seriously, Charlie. I mean, it's ridiculous, man. We could see you getting an Academy Award someday. Maybe like a 
Golden Globe. But, hey. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, you know, here here's the thing though. Doing what I do now, doing these parts, like I, I have never it's been a long time since I've been like extremely enthused about a show I was on and watching uh see I did two guest stars on on Love and Death. Oh yeah. But I was with that group of people during a time of COVID for quite some time. And it, it was in Texas and it, and I was just watching all this art from from a PA that was there for maybe a day to the producers, everybody in between. There was this massive collaboration of let's just create something. And instead of, oh, hey, I'm a star, I'm going to get an award, I'm going to do that. I get to go work on these passion projects with people that I might. I mean, I did wear the crawdad sing, uh, and I'll get a broom and a dustbin to clean up all these names later. But uh, David Strathern, you know, from Good Night and Good Luck, I got to work with him, and I spent 14 hours hanging out with David Strathern, and, and I was just like, "Are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah. This is and the, and I love the book, and I love Livy Newman, and I love Reese Witherspoon, and I'm just like, I can't believe I'm here. Just like you were mentioning before." Dude, you're in Watchmen. I know, man. I love that novella. And there I am, standing across from Giovanna Depo and Regina King and trading lines on a Damon Lindelof project in a story and novella I love. And my cousin, he always loves to break my balls. My cousin, Mike Toller, he calls me and he goes, hey, man, how come you weren't the lead in Watchmen? And I said, man, I was just lucky to be a panel in this comic book, this this yeah. novella, man, it I, it filled my dreams wildly. I cried on set. I'm so happy. Yeah, um, that's first of all, that's incredible that you get to rub elbows with all these people. And I'm like, when you're like, whenever I'm around greatness or like someone that's a like a high achiever in any field, I feel like a little bit of that rubs off on me in, in, in like some small way. Do you feel like that at all when you're around these these great? People. Oh my God, man. It, you know, it's, it's so always being the funny fat guy, everything is so big. I'm very animated. You can tell mm -hmm. watching these actors and working with a lot of these Southeast actors like JD Evermore, um, working with my, my old roommate and really good friend, Jeff Graves, uh, Chris Berry, uh, Jared Bankins. I get to watch these levels of people that I never got to be because I was always too busy defending myself or being funny. I have such a soft face, uh, you know, it's very hard to be um, aggressive or have an undertone of seriousness when my eyes are going like this. So yeah, you I get to watch. Eyes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I get, yeah. I watch these performers and I go, holy God. And I'm in it with them and they're not calling me out, which means I'm doing the right thing, mm -hmm. following the right path. And each time I get to do this stuff, I get to study these performers. And it's on film forever, mm -hmm. even if I suck, you know? So that's the thing. That's the drive of like, can I be yeah. better? Can I make people escape, make them laugh and cry when they need to laugh and cry? Because that's what the film industry did for me, being an unpopular fat kid, you know, I, having a very physical relationship with my mother. Uh, I had to find escapism. So working with all these different people, especially comedians when I was starting, and I think that's where the funny, I was built for sitcom, but we don't make those anymore in the traditional sense. So I've had to retone, retrain, but I got to use all of that and get that out of my system. So yeah, I, I, I cherish every ounce of every second that I'm on a set. Whereas when I was younger, I was cocky and having fun and being yeah. goofy because I knew that was the ammo for that. Mm -hmm. But in hindsight, I look at some of those moments and go, you could have done this, you could have done that. Why don't you do it now? You know, I was going to say I was I was talking to a friend like yesterday in in regards to, you know, I'm 39 years old. And it was something along the lines of like, if, if you had the chance, if you had the choice to take like the easy path or the hard way. And I would I was habitually known for being taken the easy path, no matter what it was, because I was just. I was bullied. I was made fun of. I, I tried to be funny. I was I voted best sense of humor my senior year or whatever. But I was literally the most unpopular person in the world until I had a bit of a growth spurt my junior year. And I wasn't just completely fat anymore, I guess. And people, uh, you know, freshmen and sophomores came in or whatever. But by being so overlooked at all times, I would constantly take the way where I 
what's the easiest path to not be made fun of? How can I get out of this situation without uh, having attention brought onto me in like a bad light or whatever? And I took that into my adult life. And I really wish, uh, you know, I, I would have ta- done harder things and, and decided to actually grind a bit more just in everything. Cause I just, I don't know why I did that. It was super character flaw. So I, I really agree with you that you easy. can't go. Yeah. You can't go back. You can do it now though. You can change it now. Yeah. So you, you, you have these moments when you're in high school yeah. where you're yeah. like, <laughs> I'm smart enough. People like me. <laughs> Most Jewish family action. Oh yeah, Dude, hey, I was. I've hey guys, people like me. <laughs> hey guys, somebody just came into the restaurant I was working at today for the lunch shift, and they said they were listening to this podcast by Dana Carvey, and it was the ha- the Hans and Franz movie that was never made. So yes, it's the Conan uh, needs a friend. Yeah, they're uh, yeah, making Conan O'Brien needs a friend. They're reading the lines and everything. Have you have That's you fun. heard this, Charlie? Yeah, what they're doing is they're doing a uh, they're doing a read through of the script. Like the movie isn't happening, but what they're doing is they're reading you what uh, Robert Schmeigel and what Dana and what Kevin came up with. And wow. yeah, I I truly love that stuff. You know, I, I, I a related story to that is uh, I was supposed to play Norm Macdonald's son on his show before he passed away, The Norm Show, oh and I booked God. it that day that it got canceled. But years later, I had my own show in two thousand eight. Um, it was like number one on CBS mobile. We beat out Letterman. We beat out uh, Big Brother. And it was Verizon flip phone. So I had a flip phone show back in 2008. And my only agreement with them is I had full run of CBS 24 hours a day, television studio, uh, where they shoot the prices right. So I'd hang down on that set. I'd, I'd go with my writers. I'd run and steal Ferguson's guests. And <laughs> one, what they were shooting downstairs was something with Norm and um, Norm and Super Dave Osborne. And Norm came up. And he's walking through the halls. I'm like, Norm, it's Charlie. How are you? He's like, oh, yeah, 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 Charlie. And I'm like, he's like, come, come hang out. We're going to be right into this one. I walk into a room. There's Norm. There's Smigel. They're smoking a fat J. There's another head writer from SNL there. And they're just shooting around these ideas. And I'm, and I, so I was listening to that on Conan O'Brien. He's a friend who I love. In fact, I really wanted to replace Andy Richter when he left the show originally. I was having yeah. my agent like go for that. But and I, 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 I watched that. I loved it. I loved it. Yeah, I love that read through. I love when people get to express those ideas. I'm finding old scripts from the shows I was doing on CBS Mobile, and I'm like, oh my God. First of all, this would never play now. Second of all, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, there, oh, there's so many. Like, dude, and so speaking of what wouldn't play now, uh, Chris in Angus, your buddy, when he's got that shirt and he's being like, he's got the, it's like got a bullet in the oh, yeah. head of the volleyball or whatever. I'm, yes. I saw that and I was like, Okay, Angus is canceled. Uh, hopefully, nobody sees this. You know, thirty years yeah. later or whatever. <laughs> Great. Yeah, it it was a different time. There was a different innocence. The good news is we weren't adults at that point shooting that. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. And it, yeah, because then I think that would come back uh, back around on us. Dude, so what was it? okay? So you and Chris lived together for fourteen years. What was it like when you guys would go out to like a nightclub or go out to a bar or whatever? Would would people recognize you and be like, "Holy shit"? That's well, we didn't go, we didn't go out to a lot of nightclubs or anything like that. But when we went to parties or bars, or whatever, Chris was well known for the American Pie movies, you know. Oh, yeah. So uh, I remember when it was called East Great Falls, and he was like, he was like, I don't know if I want to do this nerdy stuff again. And him and, and my dad, or his dad, who was kind of my dad at the time, we were we were like, yeah, you should do it, you know. You and he's like, yeah, fuck it, I'll do it. But then it was the Shermanator, the Shermanator that. I remember one of my favorite things. That was the nice thing about not being well known until they realized who we were together. Which yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But what would I would change my look so much? To, I'm a chameleon. If you look at most of the movies I've done, I look different every one of them. Well, and, your hair uh, in one of your photos where you you look like Oppenheimer almost, like Tesla. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know that that that's from uh, Barry Jenkins' The Underground Railroad that I did with my roommate Christopher Barry. That yeah, got that, the back the neck. Oh, that was phen- that was phenomenal. That almost yeah, went on the thumbnail. Yeah, but yeah, see, but you, do it. Put it on there. I love that picture. Um, but and I remember saying to Barry, I was like, I look like John Candy's brother, Hard Candy, you know. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, but yeah. So like, we were at the bowling alley. We were at a place called Jerry's Deli, very famous off of Ventura Boulevard in, in the Valley, in California. And uh, I remember these girls, and Chris had a little bit of a goatee going on, and uh, <laughs> but if you had just gotten a goatee, and. Uh, these girls are like, oh my god, oh my god, is that Shermanator? Is that Shermanator? And I just like turn back and I go, 
no, the simulator doesn't have a goatee. And they just totally were like, oh, yeah. And then just. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So I would do that. I would do that with Chris a lot. And, and we really enjoyed doing that. It was like good cop, ridiculous cop. <laughs> Dude, uh, Chris, like he, so he was been in a, a, like a ton of movies. Like Major Pain, I think was his first movie. Was that his first movie? He was. Yeah. Like, when we were shooting, uh, when we were shooting Angus, uh, we went to Universal Studios and we saw that big picture of his face and, and uh, Damon Wayans. And it was really exciting. He, so I was just going to say, Chris, though, like is a low key. Like he's a scene stealer. Like whatever he's in, I almost yeah. gravitate my eyes to him because he's 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 very good with like his eyes and his like he kind of like he's he emotes really well. I don't know really know how to say it. He doesn't really have to say anything without he can say yeah. stuff. Brilliant, brilliant and he's present. Yeah, he's good. No, he's really good. Um, I it read kind of feels like when you watch Chris Owen, you feel like you're in his shoes in all the projects he's done. Oh, for sure. I, he got he got a raw deal. The Shermanator got a raw deal in American Pie. He uh, but he got a he got a full arc in American Reunion because he got to sleep, right. he got to sleep with Nadia like four movies later, which is good. <laughs> so, finally, the sh dude when they hey Charlie when they did the Terminator uh, where he zeroes in and it's red yeah. and black and it says yes. uh, Target acquired or whatever. Yes. Oh, I lost my shit. That was phenomenal. <laughs> That was yeah, great. Yeah. Oh yeah. That was brilliant. Yeah, it was so happy. I used to I used to bust his chops a lot because my my favorite line in all the American American Pie movies was Sherman. He's like, what's up? He's like, what the fuck are you doing here? John Williams gone. And I was like, I'm sorry, Chris. It's just got a good rhythm to it. It's a genius line, and you reacted great. So be honored. <laughs> John, dude sean william scott got didn't he get noticed at working at a movie theater i read about him too he was uh, he was working at home depot where the hell are, where the only time that i listen the only time that anyone anyone at wendy's or home depot ever uh discovered anything when i was there was that their toilet was clogged after i left that's the only thing they oh discovered nothing. <laughs> yeah nothing amazing are, happened are when alex are you allowed this back incredible. in that are you allowed back in that particular restaurant yet alex yeah, hey, there's like, that kid that went to McDonald's and clogged our toilet. <laughs> uh, Charlie, man. So I want to ask you about. So okay, so 2005. I'm I'm hungover. I'm I'm feeling sick, but all of a sudden I'm flipping through the channels, and I see you. At least I think it's you, and it's in a movie called Bachelor Party Vegas. Oh yeah. I, oh yeah. I hadn't I hadn't seen you in like a starring vehicle in probably three or four years to that point, and you seriously got me through the worst hangover hangover I've ever had, Charlie. <laughs> you stole every scene in that movie, dude. Like when you're prepping them on the airplane, did they mm -hmm. let you just improv stuff, or was that on page? Most of it was on page, but I always get to play. You know that was the beauty, like the fuck Osama bin Laden, like you know, like yeah. uh, so. I love the Johnny Cash poster, by the way. There you go. Uh, let's see. Who's there. There we go. Oh, there me we and go. the gang. Oh, yeah. From the uh, paintball scene. Oh, yeah, I uh, I love that film. I, I keep that film close to my heart. Eric Burnt, uh, who wrote and directed it, was actually writing about his own bachelor party, and he wrote it very much to resemble the game. But what had happened halfway through is our DP uh, left. And you'll notice there's a different feel when we go to the jail and before the mm -hmm. jail, there's a different feel. One feels a little more John Hughes and one feels a little more like dark. It was, you when, know, when you're in the jail and the guy is behind mm -hmm. you, I'm like, this is kind of like not as light as it was. And, <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I, I, remember, I remember telling him, I was like, hey man, just, uh, I don't know how to say this, but fuck my mouth really hard with your hand. <laughs> He's like, what? I was like, yeah, just do it, man. Just like, just do it because it's too dark in here and it's too ominous, you know. So we did that, and there, there was some goofy stuff that we were doing in that movie. But I had such a great time on that film. Uh, you know, Donald Faison, who I ended up, he ended up hiring me for a couple episodes of his show, The Playbook, and then hanging out with me a few more times after that. I really like him, um, and he really made that film fun to work on. Him and Aaron Hemmelstein. Uh, Jonathan Bennett. It, it really was one of those things. Uh, Cal Penn too, because I had met Cal in the audition for Van Wilder. Yeah, I was. And, dude, I was just going to ask you that. You know, you had the connection from Van Wilder, obviously. 
Mm -hmm. So going into that audition, I felt way more comfortable booking this project. In fact, I remember I'm supposed to have this part where I smack, and I think it's part of the airport scene, is where I'm supposed to smack Jonathan in the in the sack, you know, because it's 90s humor. Oh, Our yeah. only rule was we tried not to do movies that said the word splooge in them. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and I went up to the casting director, and I actually smacked the bottom of your chair and, and i was like oh my god i just i just lost this part and that booked me the role because i just didn't even think about her i just thought of her being one of us and and she got it and she was like yeah and, and cal was like let's do this and i gotta tell you we had the most fun i remember that's when cal had booked superman returns and he's like did i get to work on you i was like dude come on so the experience for me is yeah i have so many friends trent Offick, his brother matt the producers out in Vegas. I've worked with that crew several times. Hell, yeah, uh, worked at the White House, right? Mm -hmm, very much yeah. so. Yeah. He so in Harold and Harold and Kumar. Like, I wonder if Cal had to study uh, the the doctor terms when he's going over, you know, with John Chow, and he's or did he just know that stuff off the top of his dome? I mean, he's very intelligent, obviously. I, I I gotta think. I gotta think very much though. Even if he didn't know it he was exposed to it prior to having to read those sites, mm -hmm. you know, cause uh, even between our takes on this goofy ass movie we were doing, um, this bachelor party Vegas movie, uh, which was called Vegas baby or whatever, whatever. Uh, we we're doing that. And, uh, between takes, he would just stop, shut down, put on his headphones, sit there and read his newspaper and drink his tea. I was like, that man's smart. I won't bother him too much. I don't want to rub off on him. Dude, Cal, Cal Penn is a legend. Meanwhile, back at the interview. <laughs> so Cal Penn was on House. Uh, you guys right. have seen that, right? Yeah. Uh, what did you think of his uh, performance on that show and his uh, overall story arc? You know, I, I, I saw most of his story arc. I, I was actually really happy to see him on that show. I was actually happy to see him doing something that was a bit smarter. You know, uh just because he has it in him. And I don't think he, I don't know if he wanted to go in a particular direction, but I really wanted his brain to be utilized. Cause I wasn't joking when we were working on a uh, bachelor party Vegas, you know, uh, clearly by far, sometimes the smartest man in the room, you know, and you're just, I would defer to him always. So it was really nice to see him in that world, especially with uh, Hugh Laurie and stuff like that. That man himself is a genius. So it was really neat to watch his work. Did you like his performance on that as well? Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, compared to some of the roles he had, uh, I was really impressed with him on there. He seemed like a totally different person. And I really believed his acting, you know. I believe that For sure. even though he might not have, you know, the mind of a doctor or whatever, know everything, I do believe that uh, the guy saying the stuff was capable of that. So, yeah, Exactly. Yeah, you believe that he he could obtain that knowledge and would retain that knowledge. Exactly. Yes. Thanks. Hey, Charlie, I was so I wanted to ask you a question earlier when we were talking about so when Angus first came out and you said you corrected me, you said you filmed it in 94. OK, the film yeah. comes out in 95. You're how old were you? You were 13 or 14. How old were you when the movie? No, was I was 15, 16 when we okay. were shooting. Uh, I we it did shoot until the first uh, month or so into uh, 95. But we started okay. October 13th, 2014. Um, and Chris was about a year or so younger than me. So Chris was in his 13, 14. Range, okay. or it was it uh, 14, 15 range. So when the movie comes out, mm -hmm. and are you back at regular high school at this point when the movie's released? Yeah, I went right back. I was a little late coming back to school, but I, okay. I was, uh, yeah, but I went right back to school. But I had schooling on set, so I had to do that kind of stuff too. Okay. Um, and uh, there was that girl that I was head over heels for from kindergarten to 12th grade, so I actually switched schools. I went to the school that was 12 miles away as opposed to the one that was two blocks away. Uh, you know, so, it, it, but I ended up doing like shows and stuff like that. Like, I think we did, uh, God, what was it, uh, fame. And, uh, I remember putting a little bit of my money into some stuff there. And, uh, I was really kind of excited about the prospect of what my future was going to be then, because I had a funny feeling it was just going to be odd jobs for me for the rest of my life. Cause I knew I wasn't going to be a welfare kid, even though I was a welfare kid, when I was younger, I, I knew that I, I was, I just had this mentality that a, a, a guy's not a guy unless he's working kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, at that time. 
And that was a phrase that I used to use when I was younger. Was, Gosh, not a guy unless he's working. And I, I started working at a young age. And I don't know if that was escapism, just to get out of the house. But most of the time, I lived at my grandma's. And I had like 14 girl cousins in and out of the house all the time, you know, living there. And a few guy cousins and stuff. But it was like, okay, I need a little bit of me time. So I was, I was always working, always doing something, always keeping my mind busy. And I, I think that's why I didn't quit on the acting thing. Okay. Did, did you find it hard when, so when you went back to, to, to public school, even though you switched schools to be around your boo, uh, did you, did you have a problem with people like thinking you were big timing them or did they, oh, I'm, she I'm was, Charlie. Oh, you know, like, look at me. No, she wasn't my boo. First of all, second of all, perspective boo. I do remember watching the preview for Angus and I was in a the movie theater and she and her friends were sitting behind me a few two rows back on the left and I just stood up and her friends had picked on me. I just turned around and I went, ha! You know? <laughs> so it, was, it was my most redemptious evil thing I did at that period. But I, I knew I wasn't better than anyone else, but I had the cocky sense of humor. Sure. So I, I, I definitely came off as an asshole sometimes, but I was not an aggressive asshole where you were uncomfortable to be in a room with me. Mm -hmm. You just didn't want to have too long a conversation with me because I didn't keep it too serious. Okay. Does that yeah, make sense? I, yeah, it does make sense because I, I, if you spend more than like a Zoom call with me, Charlie, if you, I deflect a lot of serious conversations and stuff through humor and I've exactly. had I've had friends in the past because stuff was so heavy in my house and so dark at times that I felt the best way to kind of break the ice or maybe escape or try to change the mood was with humor. And yeah. I had I had friends and ex-girlfriends that would they're like, you really need to go to therapy because you can't have a serious conversation for longer than like, you know, eight minutes or something. I, I got a lot of shit for that. So and you looked at her and said, oh, yeah, well, I can't have a serious conversation for less than that. <laughs> <Exactly>. Yeah. <laughs> so there. Anywho. Damn. No, I, I feel you, man. Um, so uh, what is uh, what is Charlie up to today? Um. Well, what am I doing today? Oh, I just uh, I just got an offer for a film that shoots here in, uh, I think it's in northern Louisiana. Um, and it's, it was written before the strikes that are going on right now. Uh, as long as we don't do an actor strike, I'll probably start shooting that late this, this coming month. Uh, and then, uh, I got to go up to New York to work a couple days on a series for Kamal Ahmed, who you might remember from the Jerky Boys. Um, oh, yeah. he, he, we've become friends over Clubhouse during the pandemic and stuff like that. Um, I just finished working on, uh, I can't, I can't, still can't believe I get to say this, but I, I just got done working on um, Megalopolis, uh, the latest film from Francis Ford Coppola. And uh, I got to work with some very, very talented cast, uh, Aubrey Plaza and, and John Voight and Shia LaBeouf and Adam Driver and uh, Giancarlo Esposito. And I, I do, it's just endless how much talent. Uh, uh, Gustavo Freem? Manuel. Huh? Gustavo Freem? Charlie, <laughs> yes. Does now is he yeah. as serious on set as he was at Los Pollos Loco, uh, Los Pollos Romanos? Or uh, he is. I, I didn't get to work too much with him particularly, and I can't tell you specifically who I did work with a, a lot or didn't work with. Um, I will tell you that Dustin Hoffman's in the film as well, and okay. I think this is this is the first film uh, Dustin and John had done since Midnight Cowboy. Uh, little big so. man, I'm going to go on record. Uh, probably top five film of my lifetime it was a movie like my dad and i don't have a like my dad and i have a very strained relationship but one of our one of our movies one of our go-to films was little big man uh i just that scene where he's so drunk and so down in the dumps that he's actually like living in a mud puddle do you remember that scene uh I don't know, okay no i have not He's so drunk and such a loser at this point in the film that he actually lives in the mud puddle in front of the saloon. <laughs> and this is who now? Dustin Hoffman. Oh, that's great. Um, I, I got to see that. It's really, no, it's a, it's a really, really good film. Uh, it's a classic film, so, yeah. but I'm super jealous of you. And when you said Aubrey Plaza, she's, yeah. I mean, her personality, uh, I've been watching just randomly. Her, she's been popping up on my Instagram reels for the little short videos where she's telling uh, comedic stories to uh, talk show hosts. She just kind of rips. Uh, what is it like on set with her and you? Like you've well, you, like, well, hold on one second. Slash, you want to say something, bro? 
Oh no, I was just I was listening right there. So. Okay, you you seem to say you're like. Okay, oh, oh, I, I do I, I do have one question. Just there for, it is. Do do you do you remember when you did that Angus movie? Do you remember that? Uh, like yeah, like, yeah. Were you in that you were in that right? Uh yeah yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> great great. <laughs> Do you remember when you broke? I think I was in the. I think I was in that movie. Yeah, I was. I was in that. I was in there. Yeah. Do do you have any follow up? (laughs) Chris Farley, oh my guys, we love you. I actually got to. I love Farley. Oh my god. I was set up to play his son uh, a month before he died on his brother's show. In fact, if you look at Bachelor Party Vegas. The jacket that I'm wearing on the airplane. If you look at Who's Your Daddy, the jacket I'm wearing at the Playboy Mansion esque. Yeah. Uh, that is Farley's jacket from Beverly Hills Ninja. That was created. I ended up with it. Uh, him and his brother, I got to do an impersonation with Chris in front of the audience. All the news radio guys came over. It was his brother Kevin's show, and he was going to be my dad. And Kevin is my uncle in the show. And uh, we were shooting it at Sunset Gower Lot. And I ended up with that jacket, wore that. I wore it to uh, a Walking Dead uh, panel, to, to, and I was chatting with uh, Nick Darrow, who actually did the a lot of the effects work with uh, Watchmen, and he goes, I built that jacket. And I was like, this is the one. He goes, "How?" Do you? he's like, oh, this is amazing. So what I did is I wore it for those three films. I had it up until uh, they were wrapping The Walking Dead, and I had tons of friends on that show, so I gave it to my friend, a good friend, Kerry Cahill. I wrote down, here's your jacket take care of it it belongs in your collection and uh, i gave him back his jacket that's, that's awesome. first of all yeah that's it that's awesome and you just realized that you screwed yourself charlie if you ever get in financial straits man you could have ended up on you know pawn star no i believe that. that there's there's a home for everything and one day i'll, I'll be gone you know i won't exist and all this shit is just shit but there's a person out there that built something that's been through an amazing amount of history that's been everywhere that randomly found its way back into his collection and that story to me is way better than me getting 50 to 100 grand whatever the heck that thing would go for you know in my mind it's priceless but the fact that i have it on my body in film that will never go away that will always be available that's it i i did it i have that connection you know you got it forever that's, that's what i love about this business hmm. uh beverly hills ninja is like yeah exactly I, he when he was in beverly hills ninja i had read a lot i was a huge chris farley guy and he like was having a really hard time because it was fatty fatty fall down he he really struggled mm-hmm. with that and i feel like he was so underrated for his athleticism i mean cartwheels <laughs> backflips you know somersaults and stuff um I think he I think part of his magic and his like uh whatever he had that jumped off the screen was the fact that he you could feel his you could feel his struggle inside would come right on the screen. And that's yeah. part, that was part of what ended up killing him too, to be honest with you, in my in my opinion. Because he, he felt when, everything. When we were doing uh we were doing the thing in front of the audience and Chris said to me in front of his agent, he was, he said, man, you got to stop doing that. You're going to make me lose my job. And I was like, because I was doing my Chris Farley impersonation. My hair was blonde at the time. And he said, he said, you're funny. He said, make sure that they're laughing with you and not at you. And that was the last thing Farley had said to me. And uh, it's, it's stuck with me for this round, you know, for this round of what I'm doing in the film. I mean, I'll do some improv stuff here and there. I, I just got done working with... Uh, I was up for Rinfield. I ended up cutting like a bunch of characters next morning. I love that show, but I got the improv for that. And um, I also get to work on uh, Untitled Sisters movie with Sandra Oh and Aquafina. And the scene that I have in there is completely improv- improvised. And Lisa Frankenstein, the scene that I have in there, it was structured, uh, but I got to play. You know, so it, it's one of those things where I'm going to make sure that they're laughing with me because I'm enjoying this too. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, even though the point is I'm a ridiculous looking fella in some instances or what I'm doing is ridiculous. So the scenario is ridiculous, but I am in control of that scenario. Yeah. You know, yeah. That that was important perfect. to remember. That's like the perfect. I bet you that's, yeah, that's probably difficult. 
Um, you say brother? Oh, go ahead, Josh. No, I was just saying, like, to the discussion where we started tonight, to where we came, that was just like, and, like, it came full circle, you know? So I really, I really appreciate what you said there. That's all I was saying. So, um, no worries, Josh. You know, it was said to me, you know, and it got me where I am now and working with these people. And, you know, it, it was funny during the, during the pandemic, I actually you talk about Brendan Fraser, um, but myself and Chris Berry and uh, my our friend JD Evermore, we auditioned for Scorsese uh, for, and we were called specifically and, you know, and said, you know, uh, Alan Lewis who's a casting director said, yeah, we want to read these three people from, from this agency. And we did our tapes and sent it in. And I remember them asking, you know, I retaped that day. I got an avail check. The, you know, they loved Chris's work. He loved Chris's work. Martin Scorsese did, Marty. And, and uh, JD, it's, it's one of those things where I know that because I'm doing it this way and because I'm controlling my narrative to a point, uh, that I'm going in the right direction for myself. And people who are seeing it, you know, somebody's seeing it. And that comes full circle to Love and Death on HBO or Max now. Uh, Leslie Linkleglatter and David E. Kelly, Nicole Kidman, they're all producing. But Leslie and Sunday Stevens were really the ones that picked me out for the character of Lester Gaylor, who who finds, you know, Betty Gore, um, played by Lily Rabe. And Lily reached out to me, you know, uh, at one point. I reached out and liked her post, talked to her on Instagram. And, you know... There's a, I've never felt so strong about a project because everything that's led up to it. Does that make sense? Yeah, to where you are now as a human being and all the stuff that has led you to this part to be able to play it correctly. And exactly. Honestly. Yeah, exactly. And and I, I've really, I've really felt a lot of passion where I was truly enthralled, enthralled with the show. I mean, watching Tom Pelfrey or watching Patrick Fugit and you know, just being on set with them and watching them do their thing and knowing I'm not out of place. It's been mm -hmm. a really good feeling and I hope to keep that going. That's, you know, I think that um, never, put, well, what where your career has led you, obviously, and it seems like you have self-respect big time for yourself and your craft, but not putting other people on pedestals and being able to see yourself on the same level is such a huge part of just, self-respect and, and loving yourself and you know i know that i had a tendency i don't know if you did charlie of always putting everybody above me i, oh, never, I still do i still yeah. do but then when i when i do that i realize i don't realize that i'm already on a pedestal myself that i put myself on until i'm really in it and i'm like oh my god i just lost myself in the scene I'm with this person. I'm sharing a scene with this person. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really uh, what it comes down to. Because I still do the thing where I'm like, oh my God, it's going to be this person, yeah. that person, because I admire them. And I've got to see everybody's a myth until I meet them, you know? And, and when I do get to work with them or I get to watch them perform and I'm in the same room with them, I, I feel the difference of what it felt like to put them on a pedestal as to being with them in the room and being on a level with them, you know? Yeah. And it's really, it's really kind of a neat feeling, but I still have the naivete of, you know, like, oh boy, you know, but I'm there at the same, so we all have our insecurities. That's the thing with performers, big guys, big gals, you know, different people with different defects that they call defects or different um, things that they love about themselves, but nobody else sees it the way they see it. You know, you, you have to find out what that thing is that you thought was so bad and you have to embrace it and know that it's not bad. It's just, yeah, that's very, that's beautiful. It's poignant. And for like three seconds there, I was like sucked into your speech in Angus at the end of the movie, because everybody's <laughs> different and there is no normal. And Josh, I think that in our past episodes of slash tracks and everything we've done together on the channel, even like when we had three viewers all the way to a hundred thousand viewers. Yeah. I think that we've, pushed the narrative that everybody's important everybody's opinions important nobody thinks like everybody else i think that's the beauty of life exactly uh i think that's why angus the film stands the test of time i think that's why people can have comebacks in their life professionally in you know romance whatever 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 they're doing you can all there's always another chance uh to better yourself and i think as long as you believe in yourself that's the only person that matters to be honest with you 
Um, I was going to ask you one more question, Charlie, while we still have you, because you were talking about uh, putting other people on pedestals and kind of being nervous around, you know, very distinguished uh, people that you work with. Um, when you got on set to Angus, did you understand that you were on set with Kathy Bates, who had won an Academy Award for Misery? Did you understand who you were working with, you know, with George C. Scott? I mean, did you know that or were you just like excited to be on the film? Well, you know, coming from. Hmm, I'd answer this honestly. I knew that what I was leaving behind as a kid was leading into my future. And I knew that being gregarious is how I got there. But I remember why I'm gregarious. It's because of these performers that I watched that let me cry when I need to cry, laugh when I need to laugh and just feel something that I couldn't feel with the people that were around with me, around me. And knowing that I was working with Misery Mom, you know, she let me pick out the cover for Dolores Claiborne, that picture with the house and all that. She had to make the final decision. She had her Motorola phone and to get us along, to get along with me, she invited me to the trailer. We talked and she said, you know, I need a little help, honey. Can you help me pick the cover for this? And she told me what the movie was about. And I said, this one affects me more. You know, and and uh, she made the call right then and there and said, this is going to be the cover. And she had final say so. And they did it. And then uh, I remember playing basketball outside of one of the schools. And then it was Irving Kirshner and George C. Scott. And, Irv and George C. Scott gets out of the car and I'm playing basketball. And I remember having my Jordans on that I just bought because I had money. You know, and uh, he says to me, he goes, well, you must be charming. And I said, General Patton knows my name, and I told, I told, actually, I told uh, Francis the story in my audition. I said, Francis, you were part of the, one of the first moments of Hollywood in my life because you made Patton. You made, you wrote this thing, you created this thing, you know. So it's it's all this full circle of stuff, you know. And 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 to kind of answer that question as well, we were talking about Aubrey Plaza. Two things. If you get a chance, read Talk 90s with me. It's not my book. It's by Matt Pius, P-A-I-S. And it's got all these interviews from people around my era, people I knew. And I'm pretty damn candid in that book. Mm -hmm. But uh, Aubrey and uh, Dan Murphy, her partner, wrote this book, Christmas, <laughs> Christmas Witch. Okay. And, but in the inscription, she, she found me on my last day of working on Megalopolis. And she came up to me, she goes, I have a rap gift for you. You want to hang out for a minute? I was like, absolutely. And she would always try to include me in, in, in scenes and stuff when we were working together. And she said, darling Charlie, and I can't show you because there's some stuff that's, you know, uh, private and we give away stuff. Dear Charlie, you, you have served me well and brought me much joy in this circus of freaks. We love you. We'll see you around good sir, Aubrey. And just that little bit tells me, again, that I'm in the right company. I'm doing the right thing. I'm still being me. I'm still being the guy who has fun. But I know that it's not at cost for myself. Mm -hmm. um, and meeting all these people and working with all these great people, even when I stepped on the set of Angus and seeing Larry Pressman, who was the principal, and knowing what shows he was from, and working with Rita Morano, I mean, come on, how do you not know? <laughs> and you have multiple scenes with her, like you, it's just you and her. Exactly. Carrying the entire scene alone in the bedroom. Yeah, ex exactly. And it's, it's all that, you know, that when I got there, even though I could be a little shithead here and there, because I didn't know how to handle all this stuff. Yeah. You know, and I didn't take my mom with me, I took my aunt with me. And, but there was still, I remember every moment, every moment, the good moments, the bad moments, the great moments. And I'm still friends with Patrick Reed Johnson. I'm still friends with Chris. You know, I, I reach out when I can to, to Gene Vanderbeek. I, they wanted me to be Pacey. Dawson's Creek, I went out for that thing 12 times, you know. Uh, it was one of those things where all of this was meant to be the way it was because I did revere those people when I did step on set.
That's incredible. And I still revere them today, but I remember that I am also a person. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I, a lot of, so, okay. You were nowhere near as big as Billy Bob and Varsity Blues, okay? But I ran for, I ran for Billy Bob. I, I knew that. Well. I knew that. Yeah. I did know that. And I don't think that, Lester did a great job. I mean, Lester embodied that part. He also did a movie called The Fat Boy Chronicles later on uh, before he passed away where he was a doctor and he was talking to a kid who was bullied. I don't know if you've seen that, Charlie. We had talked about me marrying him and his to-be wife. Uh, he, 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 I met him on the set of Popular and he was a huge Angus fan and we became really good. Remember, Ron Lester was great. People. Yeah, yeah. God rest um, him. Yeah, oh, absolutely. R.I.P. Ron. Um, he was a huge, like, you, Ron um ethan suplee I, I, have... I still communicate with him i love him i played his editor in uh in um art school confidential i you three in particular being who i was a loud funny fat kid who was okay at football or whatever i had you guys like kind of on a pedestal because it was like you guys at least had the balls to try to do something whether it be professionally on screen or like off screen in your in your everyday life I, cause I don't know, Charlie, when you're trying to lose 170 pounds, man, you got to find inspiration from everywhere. I was trying to pull it from any area I could. So I would replay Rudy, Rocky, Angus, mm -hmm. all these scenes in my head while I'm out there almost dying around my block. I mean, it's embarrassing to see a fat, <laughs> I'm sure my neighbors thought I was crazy. They're like, well, there's a fat kid, a uh, fat guy running around the block again. I wonder, you know, <laughs> what's going on out there, but. I've got to witness it, and man, I am so proud of you. Like, Thanks. I've seen it for three years that. now, and it's just night and day. So proud of you. It's very inspiring. I was, but I was just going to say, like, I pulled inspiration from you guys. And Ethan, I on my Instagram, or my Instagram and my Twitter, like, three or four years ago, the pand it was pre-pandemic. It was January something, like, the pandemic had not exploded yet. Ethan yeah. posted his before and after photo. And I tweeted, I subtweeted it or something. I said, wow, I'm inspired, whatever. Nobody looked at it. Nobody cared about it. The only person that remembered it was me. Literally the next day I was trying to exercise and I didn't stop for like three and a half years. And then Ethan uh, retweeted it at my before and after. And then I got a little bit of whatever, Twitter shine yeah. or whatever. But just to have Ethan even acknowledged, because Ethan, have you, you, I mean, you are obviously familiar with Ethan. He's jacked. He is he, oh he yeah like, oh. well he's got his podcast american blood i mean yeah. he, he's 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 absolutely phenomenal we continue to stay in touch through instagram I, i've always admired and like ethan Sifley. And, and sadly a lot of the times we were going out for the same stuff you know yes yes so, so it's one of those things but when i got to intercept with him or i got to hang out with him i i never did i find a more gentle soul Cool. Did did you ever get to uh, distinguish if he finally saw the sailboat? Did he ever see the sailboat from uh, the 3D image? Do you know that? Did he ever? It's a schooner. That? It's, it's a, a schooner. schooner. A schooner is a sailboat. Uh, you know, know what? Uh, <laughs> the Easter Bunny's not real. No, he, uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure uh, he. Yeah, he does. He does finally. It's in the credits. <laughs> Remember, it's in the I credits. Did, yeah, he's like, uh, it's at the very, <laughs> mm -hmm. after Truth or Date has aired. Uh, yeah. Yes. I guess, like, no, I, but I was just going to say, uh, I totally got sidetracked on this episode of Sidetrack. I but tried. yeah, I got sidetracked. Yeah, 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 How dare you? <laughs> I turned into Chris Farley there for a second. Remember, uh, Charlie, when you met Ethan Supley? No, I was going to say, though, um, Varsity Blues, uh, before I had even read that you auditioned for the role or or, the, or was or were thought of for the role, I was like, bam, that's Charlie's role. He should have got that freaking part. You were age appropriate, too. Ron was perfect. They were trying to pair uh, Vanderbeek and I up. Like I said, I went out for, I got paid for my auditions uh, for Pacey. It was the best script I'd ever written. And it ultimately came down to I just wasn't physically fit enough to like carry this kind of romance show. Sure. Um, and it was literally down to he and I, Jackson and I, and we would go in the room back and forth and stuff like that. It's one of those things. Oh yeah. My life would have been extremely different. Things would have been crazy, but mm -hmm. the show wouldn't have been as good. You know, it was the same for my name is Earl. I, I was actually up for Ethan's part. I was wow. first choice for Ethan's part uh, at, one, at one point, you know, and then uh, when Ethan get, got it, I was so happy. I was like, I can still play that. Not, not like Ethan, but I would play him very similar. But yeah. I was like, dude, Ethan embodied 
who I felt I was better than I was. So I was like, oh, this is great. Go, go Ethan. You know, it's funny. Uh, it's, and, and Jason Lee, by the way, who Ethan introduced me to at one point, um, two of the sweetest guys in the wide world. But and they remember you, and they're they're always you know they're always receptive to who you are. But how I got the role in Art School Confidential, playing uh, Vince's editor, who was played by uh, Ethan, and I was the killer of the killer in the movie of the killer, you know. And how I got that role was I went in, auditioned for it on a Saturday, knocked the casting director's socks off, and she starts crying a little bit because we had a bit of a relationship. I'm like, what's wrong with you? And she goes, I feel terrible. <laughs> She, she goes, I did, we just gave the role to Ethan Supley like an hour ago. I was just saying you out of courtesy, but you killed it. She's like, you both were cute and you were great. And I was like, oh, that's no, don't worry about that. I said, I love Ethan. He's perfect for that role. I was surprised you didn't just blank offer it to him. But can I play Ethan's editor in the film? I want to be the killer in his film. And okay. it's serious why I got it. It's bad Santa. You know, it's, it's you yeah. know, goes, I, John Malcolm, I was like, you got to, please. And she goes, let me see what I can do. Let me see what I can do. Three weeks go by. And that's the thing. I, I really chased after my dreams. You know, um, I, 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 I have a really good story that I'll, I'll write down in my book. You'll, you'll see about this last project. But how I got that role was I, I left. Three weeks later, they're about to shoot on a Monday. And I knew one of, the, uh, one of my friends, she worked in the casting office for the casting director. And I, I, I was like, come on, it's Friday. They're going to shoot Monday. Oh, my God. I was like, I'm supposed to work on this project. I know I'm supposed to work on it. And I called my manager, uh, Beverly Strong, and I said, I need the casting director's number right now. And she's like, oh, no, 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 no. That's not how that works. <laughs> and I said, listen, I will give you 10% of everything I make for the rest of my life if I'm wrong. And I don't care if it's acting or not. And she said, oh, yeah? She said, she said, I said, you can drop me if I screw this up. She says, okay. She gives me the number. I make the phone call, and I'm thinking my friend Rose McGowan is going to pick up the phone. Different gal. And uh, I I make the call, and a voice picks up, and it says, hello, you've reached casting. And I was like, oh, and it was a casting director. Holy shit. Oh. Yeah. And I go, hi. And she said, yes. And she said, this is Charlie Talbert. She's like, Oh, you, you represent Charlie? I said, no, this is Charlie. And she goes, what are you calling me for? I said, you remember when you were crying in my audition and you were upset that you couldn't do this? And I said, I really wanted to work on this. And, you know, this is how I wanted to do it. She goes, yeah. Uh, I said, what happened? <laughs> and she goes, well, Charlie, I didn't want to give you a lesser role to your friend, Ethan. And I said, oh, my God, give me a lesser role. Wear high heels and step on my groin. I don't care what you do. I got to work on this project. It's the best thing I've read since Dawson's Creek. And uh, I hear laughter in the background, and I'm on speakerphone, and this camera zoom out that just happened was how I felt. And the laughter, one of the last, was very familiar. And the other one I could tell was Terry's Zweigoff. And it was Terry and John Malkovich were in the room with the casting director. And Terry leans over to the phone and says, Charlie, yes. <laughs> and he goes, Show up to set on Monday. You got the part. And they let the other guy go, and I, I got to play the, the fellow I wanted to play. You know, and that's kind of how I ended up on on the last project. That was great. You just got to follow your dreams. You got to push through. You know, that's exactly how I got you for sidetrack, Charlie. Exactly. I just <laughs> mm -hmm. slipped into your DMs, dude. You were hoping it was a girl, and it was all of a sudden me. And I'm like, hey, Charlie. What's <laughs> And you're like, oh, let's see what's in my DMs today. Uh, you know, and then a boom, you know. And Charlie, what were you gonna say, Josh? I was gonna say we just really appreciate you coming on tonight and talking with us. It's been great. I've caught I caught myself just listening and uh being a listener of the episode <laughs> for a big part of it because y'all have uh, really the back and forth has been really good. And uh I I felt myself in a lot of y'all's stories. Um so became a listener. So yeah, but yeah, but remember, remember, remember when you were just listening? Yeah. <laughs> it was awesome. Charlie, <laughs> thank you so much for doing the show, man. I, this is the most fun I've had in a, quite a while, man. I had a blast. This is a dream come true to to be able to talk to you, man. 
No, it's such an honor to hang out with you guys, Alex, Josh. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, yeah, I mean, throw that picture on there. The, the mustache and the curly hair, I love that. Um, <laughs> but, I, I, you know, keep doing that. Just like you had to push through that wall, that barrier to lose the weight and, you know, be who you wanted to be. It's the same thing I do to get roles. And it's the same thing I do to, like, better myself when I'm performing. Because, you know, I know I'm not 100% who I want to be every day. But the parts that I am made up of, I, I like and I respect. And that's really important you know for somebody to do that there's no normal just like angus says you know the whole theme of angus there is no normal well guess what it's true that's phenomenal Dude, josh do you, just, i don't think we could end the episode any better than that i think you be, should just end it yeah, just be excellent to each other and uh, yeah yeah thank you that was great thank you charlie absolutely guys thanks so much for having me absolutely man anytime when Master Evil comes to play And Mama says that it's okay Alex and Josh are stole away And made to watch these movies To stay